Hey everyone, this is Pastor Todd and Miss Daphne. We pastor here at Transformation Church in Seminole, Texas, and we believe that this message is going to impact your life. The vision of our church is to establish, equip, and expand believers, so that is always in our mind behind every message and everything that we do. We also want to invite you to join us live or online Wednesdays at 7 p.m. and Sundays at 10.30 a.m. We hope to see you soon. Matthew chapter 18, verse 11 says this, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices. Somebody say, he rejoices. Moreover than sheep, than over the 99 that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Notice this, these simple two words in verse number 13. He rejoices. When those two words popped out at me for the first time, I, I kind of understood in one sense that, yes, he rejoices whenever the one is found and brought back. But then I kind of went a little bit deeper. I asked myself this question, and I kind of ask these kind of questions because I'm a little bit out there, a, a little bit weird in these kind of things. And, um, and I asked this question, I was like, well, why did he rejoice? Now, I know that he was happy that the one was found, but why did he rejoice? And the Holy Spirit on the inside of me said, because that one is very important to him. That one is very important to him. To him, look to your neighbor and say, you're the one. Find somebody else and say, you're the one. Come on, high five somebody and say, you're the one. Come on, you got, now if you don't help me preach today, it's going to be a long service. But if I get, if I get some amens and hallelujahs, we'll get out of here in about 5, 10, 20, 30, 50 minutes, something like that. Amen. So we believe that Jesus sees people as very important. The one is important. The multitudes are point, important, but Jesus sees people as very, very important. In fact, he thinks you're very important to him. Now, we can all, you know, talk about how important Jesus is to us. How many believe that Jesus is very important to us? My lands. I mean, I, I couldn't even imagine a life without Jesus. He is so important to me, but let me tell you something. He knows you, he loves you, and you are very, very important to him. And I'm going to prove that to you today. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. He rejoices as you're turning. He rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I want you to know today you are very important. You're the one because he created you. Let me say that again. He created you. See, your parents just conceived you, but God created you. God knew you would be born in this time, in this season. He already had a plan for you. He already knew what you would look like. He'd already know what you were going to do in life. He created you. Your parents just conceived you. But God knows you. He created you. And you are very, very important to him. Look, you never again say, you're the one. Come on, find somebody say, you're the one. He prepared things way before you were even thought of. So you could have a life that's full of blessing, a life full of abundance, a life that's created in Christ Jesus. He rejoices because you're very important to him. Another reason why that he created you and the fact that he created you is found in Psalms 139, verse 13 and 14. You can just look on the screens and read this or you can follow along with me. For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. I love what the psalmist had this vision, had this, this understanding about who he was in Christ. He knew that God created him. 
In fact, formed him in his mother's womb. You know, women that have been pregnant or are pregnant now, you know that the moment of concession, at that moment, life is birthed inside of you. You didn't create that birth. It was just through conception. And God already knew the baby that was going to be formed in your womb. And for us as parents, because I was, you know, I was not obviously pregnant with my kids. Thank God. I'm not one of those kind of guys. But anyways, I, I knew that the moment that, that Daphne was conceived our child, from that moment that the anointing of dad come up, came upon me. How many dads can remember that? You just, that dad anointing comes on you. And I realized something that that baby inside of my wife's womb, that baby was special. That baby wasn't just special because it was something that me and, me and Daphne was going to have the privilege of raising and, and then eventually, you know, sending them out to do what God's called them to do. No, that baby was special, was precious, was valuable because that baby was given to us by God. God knew our kids from the very, very beginning. In fact, in Luke chapter 12, verse number 7, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. You are so valuable to God that he even knows the hairs on your head. Some have more than others. But he knows the number of everybody's. Why? Because you are very valuable very important to him. Jesus considers you very important. He created you. You are the one. Come on, look at your neighbor again and say, you're the one. You're the one. Find some else around you and say, you're the one. As you can tell, I'm going to have you say that a lot today because I believe Jesus considers you as the one. Number two, How are you so important? How do you know that you're so important to Jesus? He chose you to do great things. He chose you to do great things. In John chapter 15, verse number 16, you did not choose me, Jesus said, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Notice something. Jesus already chose us. And appointed us that we should go and bear fruit. Or in other words, to go and do great things for him. And not only that, but our fruit, our fruit should remain. And that whatever you ask the Father, in my name, he'll give it to you. There's that assurance that we were not only just created for such a time as this, but God, through Christ, chose us to do great things. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor again and say, you're the one. I want to find someone else say, you're the one. Number three, why are you so important to Jesus? He understands you. Hallelujah. I said, he understands you. How many husbands at times don't understand their wives? <laughs> Got one preach over there. And the husbands that are nervous, they don't even look at their wives right now. It's like, uh, you don't even know. How many wives can say and testify today, I don't even understand that man of mine? Come on, ladies, help me out. My wife raised her hand fast. <clears throat> I mean, no, we don't understand each other. There's things that we don't understand on this earth. There's things that we won't really ever really fully understand, even in the future. But there's one thing that we can rest assured on, God understands us. Aren't you thankful for that? That he understands us. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 15, this version here is the century English or the, the contemporary English version. It says this, but Jesus understands every weakness of ours because he was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. So whenever we are in need, we should come bravely before the throne of our merciful God. There we will be treated with undeserved kindness and we will find help. He understands you. He knows you. You're very important to him. He understands you so much. He knows exactly how to help you. Sure, your friends might have a 
kind of an understanding. Your wife, husband might have an understanding. Your job police might have a little bit of an understanding on how to do things. But how many know God understands everything? And he's just there waiting for you to ask. And he's there to help. Look at your neighbor and say, I know you need help. Come on, find them. Say, I know you need help. I mean, oh, we need help. There's not anybody better that can help us than the very one that understands us the most. And that is our Heavenly Father. He understands us. Jesus understands us. You're there in Hebrews. Go over to chapter 13, verse number 5. Not only do we know that he created us, he chose us to do great things, he understands us. But I want to encourage you today and remind you, he will never leave you. Why? Because you're very important to him. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, let your conduct be without covetousness, but content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. There is a confidence in every believer when you understand how important you are to him and that he's promised that he would never leave you nor forsake you. There in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, you can go down to verse number 6. and goes on and says, so we may boldly say, somebody say boldly, that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? There's a confidence, there's a boldness, knowing that Jesus thinks you're very important. And you can boldly go into his presence and cry out and ask for help because the Lord is your helper. Turn over to John chapter 16, verse number 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. How do we know that we are important to Jesus? He created us. He chose us to do great things. He understands us. He's promised he will never leave us, and he's also there to help us. John chapter 16, verse 33. This is a very important scripture for the times that we live in. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now, I want you to know today that there is tribulation in the world. Jesus did not say that tribulation would stop. He said, in the world, you will have tribulation. Troubled times are here. Troubled times are going to continue to take place in these last days. But be of Good cheer. Come on, somebody. Be of good cheer. Don't be a whiny baby. Can I get up where you live? Don't be a whiny baby. Don't play the victim. Come on. Jesus warned us that we're going to be in these troubled times. But be of good cheer. Come on, listen to me. Say, cheer up. Find some rest right. Say, cheer up. But Jesus has already overcome the world. We're going to face things. We're going to have to overcome things. There is going to be some crazy things that's going to happen in these last days. But cheer up. Jesus has already overcome it. Come on. Jesus has already taken care of it. Jesus has already been through it. Jesus already knows how we're to handle it. It's a good day to be alive. Why? Because in the world there's going to be tribulation, but we can be of good cheer. Jesus has already overcome the world. Now look at what verse 33 at the beginning of this says. It says, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. You may have peace. He thinks you're so important that he actually puts his peace in you. Come on. He actually puts his peace in you. When you are born again, it was not just you getting a free trip to heaven and you don't have to go to hell. No, it was much Bigger, greater, more, more grande, or whatever, whatever. Muy grande, or mucho grande. What is, what is much bigger in, in uh, German? What? Galata. Galata. Muy galata. <laughs> Stop. Because <laughs> whatever is in this world, whatever is coming, the peace is bigger than any of that. You can face whatever you're going through right now because God already put a peace through his son Jesus inside of you. That troubled times are coming. Troubled times are here, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. 
Come on. Say, I've overcome the world. Through Jesus, we've overcome the world. So I'll say it again. Don't be a whiny baby. <laughs> Everybody's like, don't be a whiny baby. Sure, it's troubled times. Jesus said they're coming. Whining about it's not going to save anything. But be of good cheer. Jesus has overcome the world. I think you need to look to your neighbor and say, quit whining about it. <laughs> so it's like, she's the one I've been whining about. So I ain't saying it. You're there in John. Go over to Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 12. And I'm beginning to close. I only got about 20 more of these. No, I'm kidding. Begin to close. Check out Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. So Jesus thinks we're so important. That he created us. He chose us to do great things. He understands us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He's always going to help us. He's our peace in troubled times. In Hebrews chapter 8 verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawlessness deeds. Their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Your past is gone when you repent. He does not remember all your past failures. What? No. As far as the Bible goes on, <clears throat> it says, as far as the east is from the west, so far I've removed transgressions. Living in the past is living in failure. Whether it was good, bad, or ugly, living in the past is just living in failure. God's got such an amazing plan today for you. And he's forgiven you and he's forgotten the past. Hallelujah. Come on. He's forgotten the past. Your past failures have been forgotten. The insecurities of possibly making another mistake can go away because you know God is with you. God stands with you. He helps you. He strengthens you. He's chosen you. He's leading you. He's guiding you. His ways are always higher than our ways. You are very important to him. You're the one. Come on, you're the one. Come on, high five somebody and say, you're the one. Come on, high five somebody else around and say, you're the one. You're the one. He's forgiven us. He's forgiven and forgotten our failures. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. We know this scripture, but it's good to be reminded of, that, of this. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Not only has he forgotten your past failures, but he knows your future. I've said this many times, and I'll continue to say this. God is not confined by time. He created time. So to think that God can op only operate in a certain amount of time in a day, that's incorrect. That's putting God in a box. God is bigger than time. In fact, God's already been in our future. God's already been in our future. He already sees and knows because he's not confined to time. So if he already knows our future, how difficult is it for us not just to stop and say, God, I trust you. You already know because you've already been there. So why fight the process? I'm just going to trust you, God. I'm just going to lean on you instead of leaning on my own understanding. You already know my future. You've already got it planned out, so I'm just going to trust you. Come on, somebody. Just say, I trust you, Lord. Come on, just lift up your hands right here, right now. Just lift up your hands. Just say, Lord, I just trust you. I just trust you with my job. I trust you with my family. I trust you with my finances. I trust you with all the stuff that's going on. Lord, I trust you right now. I believe that you know my future, and I trust you. I'm not going to complain about what's going on today because, God, I already know you've been in my future, and I trust you with everything in my life. In Jesus' name. In John chapter 15, verse number 13, the Bible says this, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Do you realize that Jesus was willing to lay down his life for you? Why? Because you're very important to him. He went to the cross, and we know this, but he went to the cross, died on the cross, arose again on the third day. Why? Because you are very important important to him. You're the one. You're the one. It's not prideful. It's not arrogant to say that. No, not at all. In fact, you're recognizing what Jesus has done for you. 
You're recognizing what he is doing for you. To, 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 to make the statement that I believe that Jesus created me different than anybody else, he created me special, is to say exactly what the Bible says about you. You're different. Come on, how many believe you're different? Ask your neighbor, they'll tell you, you are different. We all are different. There's not anybody here exactly the same as the other. Even our fingerprints are proof of that. Everything about our physical nature is different. Even in our spirit bands, we're all different. Why? Because our voices are different than anybody else's voice. And that's whenever God says, speak to the mountain and command it to be removed. Your voice is the only thing that can move that mountain. Let me say it again. Your voice is the only voice that can move the mountain that is in front of you. My voice can't move your mountain. My, my wife's voice can't move my mountain. Are you, are you catching what I'm saying? I, can, I, can, I have to speak to the mountain. I can come alongside my wife and, and pray with her and agree with her, but if she has a mountain in her life, she has to say it. She has to speak to that mountain to command it be removed. Amen. Our voice is different than any other voice. Why? Because we're all created differently, but all in the image of God. And Jesus thinks you're so important that he was willing to lay his life down for you. And I'll close with this scripture. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Everything I just said about how important you are to Jesus, that will never change. That will never change. People will come and go. You'll get older. You'll get all the life has happened, but there's one thing that will never, ever change. Jesus thinks you're very important to him. You're the one. You're the one. Now, I want you to put your hand over your heart and just repeat this after me. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. I come before you today. And I receive your love. You are, you are so amazing. You created me. You chose me. You've forgiven, forgiven my past. You've given me a future. So today, I embrace you as my Lord and Savior. And my very best friend. In Jesus' name. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? Come on. Aren't you thankful for Jesus? Aren't you thankful for Jesus? In the times that we're living in, it's so important that we get back to just a simple gospel. A simple gospel. Like what happened yesterday when people would go out into the streets and, and pray for people. The simple gospel. In the times we're living in, it's not only just hearing the simple gospel, but it's doing the simple gospel. We need to apply what we learn. Amen. Go and look at your neighbor and say, we've got to apply it. We're going to apply what we've learned. So this is what's going to happen. Here in a moment, we're going to be dismissed. I'm going to come back, back up here, and we're going to pray us out, and we're going to have a good time just fellowshipping and having a party. But I want you to know this, that there are people, if you're visiting here today, this is your first time or you've just come back, for this whole month we've been praying for people, the one. And actually at the very first of this month, we actually wrote names on the cards. You probably saw them out in the foyer area. And if you are one of those ones, I just want you to know you're an answer to prayer. Maybe there's some, amen, yeah, amen, you're an answer to prayer. And maybe there's some that couldn't make it like the one that I wrote they couldn't make it today. They're, they went out of town. But that's all right. The seed was still sown. Come on, the seed was still sown. And no judgment on that or condemnation or anything like that. No, seed was still sown. And I believe that they're going to be coming back to church. Hallelujah. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to pray for the one. Even though today we found out that we're the one, but we're going to pray for the one. Amen. So let's just lift up our hands right here, right now. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we as a church, we come in agreement for the one. 
Lord, we pray for those cards. We pray for those people that are represented on those cards. If they're here today, praise God, they're an answer to prayer. But Lord, if they're not, we believe that they'll come into your house. Lord, just like you did, Jesus, you went to church all the time. You were in the temple all the time. And we're followers of you. We, we, we thank you, Lord, Jesus, that you're, you're equipping saints to go out into the highways and the byways and compelling them to come into your house. And, Lord, we thank you that right now your hand is moving on their lives. We pray that you give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened, that we may see and know all that you have for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for drawing people. You said, if my name be lifted up, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all people to me. So, Lord, I thank you for the drawing of people into your house in the name of of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said...